Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's 1 p.m. Eastern, so we'll just kind of get started. I'm so happy to be learning together again. Uh, today's class is a Hasid in, uh, in medieval garb, uh, piety and popular religion in Ashkenazim behind with Dr. Rachel first. Um, if you are uh, watching us uh, live on Facebook, we're happy to uh, have you with us as well. Um, feel free to engage with us uh, by writing a comment on, sh on the chat uh, on Facebook, and I'll be monitoring uh, those comments and uh, reading them to Rachel. Um, if you're with us uh, here on Zoom, um, I'll be sending an invitation to become a panelist. Uh, if you wish, you can accept the invitation. Uh, that would allow you to uh, engage and unmute yourself in class. You can also uh, engage uh, through the chat, again, by writing. Um, and uh, with that, I'll turn this to you, Rachel. Great, thank you very much. Um, welcome back to everyone who is rejoining and uh, welcome to all of those who are joining for the first time as well. Um, I want to only very briefly today um, relate to summarize what we discussed in our class last week um, and then very quickly turn to um, our topic for this week. So last week we have been over the course of the past several weeks looking at piety as it is expressed in the writings of the so-called Hasidei Ashkenaz, um, and in particular in Sefer Hasidim as one of the primary expressions of that, um, of that group um, of those authors. Um, last week, we took a look at the um, sort of obsession or extreme focus on sexuality, and in particular, sexual sin that gets expressed in Sefer Hasidim and in some of the other writings um, by the, by, uh, the Hasidei Ashkenaz, um, and in particular in, uh, on the fastidiousness, on the um, extreme attention that they gave to undertaking actions or to avoiding all possibility of encountering, of coming into um, these situations that might lead them to sexual sin. We'll return as, um, as I keep repeating, we're going to be returning to some of those themes and trying to pull them all together in our final class in two weeks time. But today I want to focus on a new topic and that is charity. Um, so our question for today is going to be, what was the distinctive or unique way in which Hasidei Ashkenaz, the authors of Sefer Hasidim, related to charity as a form of or as an act that expressed piety, piousness. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you now. Bear with me for just a moment. Um, and in the meantime, um, yes, um, for those who want the, uh, who did not yet get the source sheet from last week, excuse me. Um, I hope that that is now up in the chat. Okay, um, so what I'd like to, uh, before, we, before we begin, I'd like to say at the outset um, that certainly charity as an act of piety, as a form of piety was not distinctive or unique in any way to Hasidei Ashkenaz. Um, we know already from Talmudic times that charity was focused on as a particular way of, you know, certainly doing good deeds in the world, but of expressing piousness. Um, just as a, a in brief, um, the Gemara already says, charity can save one from death. An act of acts of charity um, have the power to overcome one's um, negative fate. Um, we know from the uh, from the liturgy of the High Holidays that we say, and this is also from rabbinic teachings, that acts of um, atonement as well as prayer and charity um, are also have the power to um, to change uh, to change one's fate to uh, change change a bad decree, um, and so this again. The, the giving of charity, the focus on charity as an act of piousness um, was fairly widespread in the period which we are discussing. Um, I want to also note, um, we have discussed the work of Elisheva Baumgarten in previous weeks in some of our previous classes. Um, and in her book on 
piety, practicing piety um, in medieval Ashkenaz, um, she talks extensively about the way in which um, for all Jews in medieval Ashkenaz, for the Jewish community of medieval Ashkenaz as a whole, um, acts of charity became a particular focus of piety. And I'll just quote very briefly from her conclusions. Um, she writes, medieval Jews in Ashkenaz, like their Christian neighbors, formalized a mechanism for assuring redemption and commemoration after death by pledging or donating charity as a gift for the soul during their lifetime. So she writes extensively about the unique forms or the distinctive ways in which charity was expressed during this period, again, across medieval Ashkenaz. Um, this practice became part of an economy of piety that was widespread among Christians and Jews in Northern Europe during the high middle ages. Um, and I say this as a background before we get uh, before we get started discussing Hasidei Ashkenaz um, as a means of appreciating or returning to a theme that I have constantly been circling back to, which is the question as to whether the the forms of piety that we can see in the writings of Hasidei Ashkenaz were distinctive to this ostensible group of a uh, unique group of people, or whether they represented something more uh, widespread, something broader in the society that they were a part of. Um, we'll again going to be returning to this theme uh, later, but what I want to, what what I would like to take a look at today is nonetheless the unique or the different or the distinctive ways that attitudes toward charity as a form of piety get expressed in the writings of Hasidei Ashkenaz. So despite the fact that this was a very, seems to have been a very widespread value, we're going to see today that there was a particular way that it was expressed in the writings of Hasidei Ashkenaz, um, a particular attitude towards charity as piety that was embraced by the authors of Sefer Hasidim. Um, and we're going to try and pinpoint just exactly what was distinctive or was unique about that approach. So let's begin, let's delve right in to a um, very uh, famous passage from Sefer Hasidim, um, which you see here in front of you. If the Holy One gives wealth to the rich man and he does not give to the poor, then he gives to one what could have provided for a hundred. And the poor come and cry out before the Holy One, you gave to him what could have provided for a thousand and he provided me with no benefit. And by the way, I wanna pause here because there was one other uh, piece of information that I wanted to give you before we began reading this passage, which is that the authors of Sefer Hasidim do treat charity or discuss charity fairly extensively. There are two very long segments within Sefer Hasidim, or at least within the Parma edition of Sefer Hasidim, which I've mentioned previously, is the longer and more extensive version of Sefer Hasidim. There are two long sections, each comprised of dozens of passages that specifically focus on charity and the way the Hasid is supposed to relate to charity. So this is one of those passages. Um, okay, so let's go back again. I'll start from the beginning. If the Holy One gives wealth to the rich man and he does not give to the poor, then he gives to one what could have provided for a hundred. And the poor come and cry out before the Holy One, you gave to him what could have provided for a thousand, and he provided me no benefit. And God makes a calculation with the rich man. The Hebrew here is v'niframin ha'ashir. As if he had robbed many. And God says to him, I gave you wealth so that you could give according to your financial means to the poor and you did not give. So I will take back from you as if you had committed robbery and as if you abused my deposit because I put wealth into your hands so that you could distribute it to the poor and you appropriated the wealth for yourself. Now I wanna ask you based on any general uh, information or any general knowledge that you have about Judaism's attitude toward charity or toward the accumulation of wealth more generally, 
what about this passage strikes you? What is the what is the under what do you think is the underlying message of Sefer Chasidim here? And what about it is striking to you? Uh, shall I say something? Please. Anyone as welcome um, to jump in. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I would say the idea that wealth, the uh, first of all, the idea that we're not responsible for our own wealth, that that God has provided the wealth and he can return, he can take it away at any time. And the idea that wealth is there to, for the greater good. Uh, and uh, and it, ju- it actually just reminds me of, you know, uh, the prayer we say at, for, at Shachrit, uh, do not judge the poor un- unfairly and do not judge the rich unfairly. In other words, everyone the same, but anyway. Okay, so thank you for highlighting the underlying assumption here, which is that the, the, the riches that come to a wealthy person are provided by God. And as you continued on, right, they can also be taken by God, right? So definitely this attribution of wealth, um, not to uh, perhaps one's own uh, merits entirely, but to God, um, that's some, that is a way I think in which um, the this passage in Sefer Hasidim connects up with a long-standing tradition uh, within Judaism. What any other any other comments or thoughts on what about this passage sounds distinctive or unique? What strikes you about this passage concerning the attitude of Sefer Hasidim to wealth or to charity, the sharing of the wealth? Um, it's it's not uh, a certain percentage that you have to give, but rather it, it's it's uh, it's if you can give to a thousand, you have to give uh, that it's not yours. It uh... okay, and so here, so you're so I think what you're pointing out, Chaim, is that unlike some halachic passages that we may be familiar with, um, that. Uh, again, over the course of generations, attempted to really regulate charity, to turn charity into the type of mitzvah or the type of commandment that has very specific parameters, how much, um, to whom, under what circumstances. Um, Sefer Chassidim here doesn't seem to be um, delving into or, or engaging with those kinds of questions, but treating it on a more general level, right? The importance of giving, the significance, the need to give. I want to I want to underline for you um, the sentence, it's about four lines up from the bottom in the English, right? God says to the rich man, or or, uh, again, first the author of Sefer Hasidim tells us that God has made, makes a calculation with the rich man or God relates to the rich man as if he had robbed other individuals, right? And then God says to the rich man, Right, I gave you wealth and you didn't share it, so I will take back from you as if you had committed robbery. Right? What does this suggest about the attitude of Sefer Hasidim, of this of this author, to the very notion that a person is in possession of riches? Is that a good thing? That a person is in possession of riches is that a positive thing? Is it a negative thing? What do you think this implies for the authors of Sefer Hasidim? There's a responsibility that goes with it, and that if you're not true to it, you you literally, in God's eyes, have committed a crime. Okay, so in other words, um, if you have wealth, you have responsibility, and if you don't share your wealth then you have committed robbery, right? But I want to suggest that there's something here that seems, there seems to be an undertone here of negativity toward the very possession of wealth, Mm -hmm. right? There seems to be a suggestion that the purpose of accumulating wealth or the value of accumulating wealth is exclusively 
in order to share it with others. It's exclusively in order to give tzedakah. If you don't give tzedakah, then the very fact that you own these possessions is like robbery. Mm -hmm. Right? The owning of wealth, the accumulation of wealth, and let, let's assume that this person acquired his wealth under perfectly uh, appropriate circumstances, right? There's no suggestion here that this person stole any of his wealth or uh, committed any kind of fraudulent acts in order to accumulate his wealth, right? Mm -hmm. God gave the wealth to this rich person, right? So let's assume that it was a wealth that was come into perfectly honestly, perfectly uh, appropriately. But nonetheless, having that wealth is like robbery, right? Mm -hmm. That undertone, I want to suggest, is pretty foreign to a long-standing Jewish tradition concerning wealth. Moreover, right, this what this passage seems to suggest is that the the wealth, right, is supposed to be distributed almost entirely, right? Mm -hmm. God gave the wealth to one person, the person could have provided for a thousand. Because the perverse the person didn't provide for a thousand, then that's considered robbery. In other words, the assumption seems to be, the underlying uh, assumption seems to be that this wealthy person should not have held on to any of his wealth, right? This should have been, he was given this money only in order to share it with others, not in order to live well himself in any respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, just to give you a briefly a sense of how that differs from some classic approaches within Jewish tradition, I want to take a quick look here, just skipping forward for a moment, at this passage from, excuse me, I went a little bit too far, um, at this passage from Maimonides, right? This is from Maimonides' Hilchot Staka, um, where Maimonides, and again, Maimonides is drawing upon longstanding Talmudic and earlier medieval tradition, writes, one should never dedicate or consecrate all of his possessions. He who does so acts contrary to the intention of scripture. Moreover, such an act is not piety, right? Maimonides doesn't mince words here, but folly. Since he forfeits all his wealth and will, since he who forfeits all his wealth and will will become dependent on other people who may show no pity towards him. Of such and those like him, the rabbis have said, and this is a quote from Tehillim, the pious fool is one of those who caused the world to perish. And here, Chaim, uh, picking up on the point that you mentioned beforehand, the Rambam takes this to a very concrete level. Rather, one who wishes to spend his money on good deeds but spend no more than one fifth of his wealth so that he may be as the prophets commanded, one who orders his affairs rightly, whether in matters of Torah or in the affairs of the world. Right, and again, think about this in mm -hmm. contrast to the passage we saw from Sefer Hasidim. The Rambam here is taking a very different approach, I think, and, and the Rambam is more consistent with what we see uh, in, in classic Jewish tradition, All right? The idea that accumulation of wealth is not in and of itself in any way problematic or bad, right? A person who is wealthy, a person who is rich, is blessed by God, is lucky, right? Certainly bears an obligation to be generous um, as the authors of Sefer Hasidim indicate as well, but is in fact obligated also to be responsible to him, to his own self, to his family with his wealth, right? This is the person is not supposed to, is not expected to, and is in fact not supposed to give away all of his wealth. Um, again, the Rambam, as I said beforehand, um, is pretty um, pretty straightforward, pretty um, sharp about calling such a person a chassid shote, a pious fool. Where then did the authors of Sefer Chassidim stray, or what perhaps might have instigated them to 
diverge, to digress in this way from longstanding Jewish tradition. And again, if we had more time, I would show you that this is not only the Rambam's position, but in fact, broader Jewish approach altogether. Um, since we don't have so much time, unfortunately, um, I will allow myself for just one moment um, to cite uh, the, a summary of this position, um, of this uh, from Joseph Isaac Lipschitz's article um, published in Azure in 2004, um, in which he writes that Judaism's affirmation of wealth, and this is, you know, he has uh, prior to this quotation, he has obviously demonstrated the extent to which that is the case. Um, and he writes that Judaism's affirmation of the wealth becomes more striking when one considers its attitude toward poverty. As opposed to the classical Christian view, nowhere in Judaism is poverty associated with righteousness. In the rabbinic teachings, poverty is first of all considered a form of pointless suffering. There is nothing worse than poverty, we find in Exodus Rabbah. One who must weigh every penny, it is as though he bears all the suffering of the world upon his shoulders and as though the curses from Deuteronomy have descended upon him. For this reason, Jewish law calls upon man to do everything in his power to avoid becoming dependent on his community for his welfare, right? And that's, I think, the Rambam's point as well. As Rabbi Akiva taught his son, it is better to profane your Shabbat than to become dependent on others. From his perspective, man is never excused from taking responsibility for himself and is never allowed to make himself a burden on others. So I think the author's point here is that not only does classic Judaism not in any way denigrate the idea of being wealthy. Um, not only does Judaism not obligate the wealthy person to give away all of his possessions, um, but in fact, to a certain extent, Judaism valorizes wealth um, or Judaism sees poverty at least as certainly a non-ideal condition not by any means an expression of righteousness in and of itself. That's of course not to say that a poor man cannot be righteous or that every wealthy man is by definition righteous, far, far, from, far be it from that. Uh, however, um, there is similarly no equation between poverty and righteousness or between wealth and sinfulness. And that is where Sefer Hasidim starts to digress. Um, in fact, Sefer Hasidim, many suggest, sounds in this regard, and this should already not be surprising for those of you who have uh, participated in earlier sessions, we've already seen on various scores ways in which Sefer Hasidim and Hasidut Ashkenaz seem to echo certain Christian ideas that were probably current in their own environment um, more than or perhaps in parallel to their, its rootedness in Jewish tradition, right? We have discussed in previous weeks how there's in fact, there's an ongoing debate among uh, contemporary scholars of Hasidut Ashkenaz as to the, the extent to which Hasidut Ashkenaz drew from or were influenced by or were impacted or internalized um, contemporaneous Christian teachings. We discussed that in particular when we spoke about their program of their distinctive program of penance, um, which in many respects also diverged from classic Jewish tradition. And here too, right, although there is a bit of debate among contemporary scholars of, uh, of Hasidei Ashkenaz, um, here too, with regards to the attitude of Sefer Hasidim towards poverty versus wealth, the giving of charity versus the accumulation of wealth, it sounds like Sefer Hasidim strays into what we might consider more classic Christian territory. Um, and since we similarly um, don't unfortunately have time to delve into the Christian sources to see how that uh, is in fact expressed in uh, in, in, classic in classic Christian thought. Here too, I just want to um, beg your pardon and just look at this um, brief summary of that, of, the, of, of some of those ideas. Um, here too, again, I'm borrowing um, from Isaac Lifshitz's article. Um, he writes, since Christianity's earliest days then, so 
excuse me, I'm just in Chrome because I can't see my own screen. Um, right, the ownership rights were severely circumscribed by making ownership of property conditional upon its proper use, that is for meeting one's basic needs, the church fathers, so we're talking about very early Christian theology, raised the possibility that improper use would cause the forfeiture of one's claim to his own property. Property in as much as it exists at all exists not as dominion, but as license of use. If property is misused, the ownership is invalidated and the property can in theory at least be confiscated in order to be put to better use. It follows from this that the unlimited accumulation of property is considered wrongful. One who has more than he needs has too much. Individual wealth is an affront to the principle of the equality of mankind and an affront to God himself who in his mercy granted man permission to possess property solely on condition that it be used appropriately, right? Think about this um, in light of the passage that we saw from Sefer Hasidim, and you be may begin here to hear some parallels. Um, Lipschitz goes on to demonstrate or to, to quote Augustine, to quote Ambrose. These are some of the important early church fathers, the early church theologians um, who address this question of ownership of property, um, of attitude towards wealth. Um, and I just want to again briefly quote the following paragraph, excess property or property possessed by one who does not need it yet refuses to give it to the poor. Again, this is precisely the situation that that passage from Sefer Hasidim we saw was addressing, is judged by Augustine to be improperly used. His teacher Ambrose, one of the fourth century's eminent church fathers went so far as to say, it is no less a crime to take from him that has than to refuse to succor the needy. By drawing a legal equivalence between refusing to give charity and stealing, right, again, think about Sefer Hasidim. Ambrose further circumscribed the boundaries of private ownership, not only condemning the accumulation of excessive wealth, but also granting legitimacy to the poor who would steal from those rich who refuse to give of their wealth freely. In effect, the church made forcible appropriation of an individual's property on behalf of the poor a legitimate act, right? If owning property without sharing it is in and of itself like robbery, right? Is in and of itself a crime, then appropriating the property of the wealthy by force can become a legitimate or even perhaps a pious act. And now I wanna flip back for just a moment to that passage, the opening passage that we saw from Sefer Hasidim and to read it one more time so that we can hear some of these echoes the echoes of some of these early church teachings that were very much current in the medieval German, the medieval European world in which the authors of Sefer Hasidim operated. I want to be able to hear some of those echoes in this passage from Sefer Hasidim in contrast again to um, what we saw, what we read was the more classic Jewish approach. All right, let's read this one more time. If the Holy One gives wealth to the rich man and he does not give to the poor, then he gives to one what could have provided for a hundred. And the poor come and cry out before the Holy One, you gave to him what could have provided for a thousand and he provided me no benefit. Here, now, now here's where we have to start paying attention. And God makes a calculation with the rich man as if he had robbed many and says to him, I gave you wealth so that you could give according to your financial means to the poor and you did not give. So I will take back from you as if you had committed robbery. Right? The fact that you did not give this charity is like robbery. And as if you had abused my deposit because I put wealth into your hands so that you could distribute it to the poor and you appropriated the wealth for yourself. Now, aside from this um, distinctive attitude toward the very idea of accumulating wealth, the very idea of having wealth, and also by the way, um, a suggestion that runs throughout many of these passages in Sefer Hasidim, that in fact, not only is there no shame in being poor, but perhaps there is something positive. Perhaps there is something in fact righteous about being poor, which again is not a classic Jewish idea. Um, as I was saying beforehand, bears much similarity to more classic Christian approaches. Sefer Hasidim 
there's another way, excuse me, in which Sefer Hasidim, in which Hasidei Ashkenaz um, reflect a very distinctive approach to the question of tzedakah charity as an expression of piety. And I want to highlight that by looking at the following passage. Right, this is also from one of those long, part of that, the, the long segment of Sefer Hasidim that deals with charity. And the author writes, better is a handful with quietness, right, and it's melochaf nachat is the Hebrew, that a man gives to the God-fearing, yirei shamayim, the God-fearing poor, yirei shamayim aniyim, who have lost their money, then the both the hands full with travail, right? These are, this is a quote from, uh, from Kohelet, from Ecclesiastes, who gives it to the poor who are not decent. And the Hebrew here is important, enam mehuganim, right? So in other words, better to give one hands full to the God-fearing poor than to give two hands full to the non-decent poor, right? And non-decent is, right, the question of exactly how we translate a nam mehuganim, um, we're going to see becomes, uh, will become a matter of debate. Um, but I think one, one possible way um, is to translate it as those who are not decent as compared to the yar shamaim, the God-fearing poor. The author of Sefer Hasidim goes on here to say, yeah, it is viewed as a sin for what he gives to the corrupt ones, and the Hebrew here is the pritzim, they will spend on whores or gluttony, and he raises it up and sustains those who rebel in this world against God. But what is the, what is the message of the of Sefer Hasidim here with regards to the appropriate way to give charity. What is the author of Sefer Hasidim here promoting? That, the, that <clears throat> it's not just giving charity, it's that you've got to give to people it makes a difference if you're a poor person in, but whose intentions are good versus a poor person uh, who is only going to, as it says, um, spend that money to, it, it only enables them to go further and further down the path of uh, doing no good and doing harm, not only to the world, but to themselves. Okay, so in other words, for the author of Sefer Hasidim, there's a hierarchy of poor, right? Not all people, not all poor people are equal. Um, more specifically, not all poor people are equally deserving of charity. That's from the perspective of the poor. From the perspective of the charity giver, the one who is um, attempting, who wants to engage in this act of piety, this makes a difference because what it suggests is that not all acts of charity are equal. Giving charity to the worthy poor is very different than giving charity to the non-worthy poor, right? And as you said beforehand, the difference between worthy poor and the non-worthy poor seems to be, um, again, their uh, their general their general being in the world, right? The yar eshamayim versus the inam mehuganim. Right, those who are um, God-fearing versus those who are not God-fearing. Right, the suggestion is that the non-God-fearing people will spend this money for nefarious purposes. But what's very, what's to me even more striking, is the way in which the author of Sefer Hasidim places the burden, a very serious burden of responsibility, on the charity giver. So much so that giving charity to the non-deserving poor, right, it's not only a less worthy act, what does this author of Sefer Hasidim calls it, call it? There's one word that I had to underline in this passage, it would be, 
I don't have the passage in front of me. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. If you can't see the screen, then you don't yeah. have the passage in front of you. So I will reread it for you. Or Chaim, perhaps you wanted to, to chime in. With the Peritzim. The Peritzim, oh, the corrupt is. ones, right? The, In other words, yeah. the corrupt ones, those are the Enam, the Huganim. Those are the people who are going to misuse the charity. But for the giver of the charity, what does the author of Sefer Hasidim call this misplaced act of charity, right? It's not only a misuse of his or her funds. It's not only a perhaps less worthy form of charity. It is in fact a- The merit. Sin. It's merit, it's rebellion. Yeah, um, it's, it's, in other words, well- It's the, a stand. The, after the pritzim are rebellion, right? By giving the money to these unworthy poor, the charity giver is, um, is is supporting rebellion, right? Supporting those who rebel against God, is supporting rebellion against God, is supporting these um, unsavory and in fact corrupt acts, the giving of the, 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 the whores, the gluttony, et cetera, et cetera. But for the giver of the charity, what the author of Sefer Hasidim here that says that I think is so far reaching is that it is viewed as a cinch in a lo avon. Right, giving charity wrongly again is not just a misuse of funds or a misplaced pious, pious piety, misplaced act of uh, of charity. It is in fact considered a sin. Mm -hmm. Now, here too, I want to acknowledge that the idea that the poor can be uh, somehow put into a hierarchy that there are more deserving poor and less deserving poor when it comes to giving out charity, that in and of itself is not unique to Sefer Hasidim. And I want to take a quick look now at a passage from the Talmud Bavli itself, which makes such a suggestion. Right? This is nonetheless, and we'll come back to it, there is still something very far reaching and distinctive and unique about the passage that we just saw from Sefer Hasidim. But to make clear that there is a more classic concept of, again, high, putting the poor into some form of hierarchy, um, let's take a look at this passage from the Talmud Bavli, where Rabbi Isaac, Rabbi Yitzchak further said, what is the meaning of the verse? And he's quoting here a verse from Proverbs. Proverbs what uh, he that follows after righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness and honor, the Hebrew is, Right. What does that verse mean, asks Rabbi Yitzchak. Could it possibly mean that because a man has followed after righteousness or has pursued tzedakah, which really means here charity, he is going to find charity, right? Could that be the meaning of the verse, right? That seems to imply that because a person who was wealthy went out of his way to give tzedakah, it seems to, if you read the verse that way, then it implies that when he comes into a situation in which he needs tzedakah, he will certainly receive it, right? That can't be the meaning of the verse, says Rabbi Yitzchak, because we just know that that's not true. Unfortunately, giving tzedakah doesn't guarantee that when you yourself are in need, you will find the funds available. So that can't be the meaning of the verse from Proverbs, from Mishlei. Instead, says Rabbi Yitzchak, the purpose of the verse is to teach that if a man is anxious to give charity, the Holy One, blessed be he, furnishes him money with which to give it. Right? So, rodef tzedaka, yimtsa tzedaka, one who chases after charity will find charity. Right? What that means is that one who makes efforts to give tzedaka will come onto some, one way or another, will find the means to be able to in fact, fulfill the acts of charity, the acts of piety that he wishes to. That's Rabbi Yitzchak's take. Rabbi Nachman bin Isaac says, here's another idea. The Holy One, blessed be he, sends him men who are fitting recipients of charity so that he may be rewarded for assisting them. And here, this is where I want you to start paying attention. Rabbi Nachman bin Yitzchak says, no, 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 no. When the verse in Mishlei says, rodech tzedaka, yimtsa tzedaka, what it means is that God, one who wants to give tzedakah, will be 
rewarded, so to, so to speak, by God, by in fact having or, or having the opportunity to give tzedakah to the right kinds of people, to the fitting recipients of charity. Well, what does that imply? It implies that there's such a thing as non-fitting recipients of charity. So the Gemara immediately asks, well, who then are unfit? What does that mean, unfitting recipients of charity? To which the Gemara responds, such as those mentioned in the exposition of Rava, when he said, what is the meaning of the verse from Yirmiyahu? And this is when Yirmiyahu wanted to uh, sort of curse the people of Anatot who had been pursuing him. Rava says, uh, excuse me, Yirmiyahu says, let them be made to stumble before they, before thee, in the time of thine anger, deal thou with them. What does that mean? Well, it mean, well, Jeremiah said to the Holy One, blessed be he sovereign of the universe, even at the time when they conquer their evil inclination and seek to do charity before you, cause them to stumble through men who are not fitting recipients so that they should receive no reward for assisting them, right? It's an interesting reading of uh, Yirmiyahu's request to God um, as a, a way of punishing the people of Anatot who had pursued him, right? Make it so that even when they wanna do good deeds, their good deeds are not fulfilled. Specifically, even when they want to give charity, make it so that the, pe the only people that present themselves to be recipients of this charity are non-fitting recipients, inappropriate recipients, non-deserving poor. Why? So that this way, even when they go out of their way to do good acts, they won't get rewards for their good acts, right? For our purposes, all of this is interesting because what it suggests is that already for the Talmud, there is such a concept of deserving poor versus non-deserving poor. So what then, and I'm gonna turn back to the passage that we saw from Sefer Hasidim, what then do I wanna suggest is distinctive about the approach of Sefer Hasidim? Excuse me, let's go back there. All right, what's unique about the approach from Sefer Hasidim if we see that the Talmud itself already does contain this idea of a hierarchy of poor, some poor who are more deserving of tzedakah than others. And here again, I wanna to return to what I was underscoring beforehand and to suggest that what is distinctive, what, what goes well beyond any suggestion in the Talmud or in other classical Jewish sources is this idea that is promoted by the author of Sefer Hasidim, that not only is giving tzedakah to the quote unquote wrong people lacking in reward or not such a worthy act, the idea that it is in fact a sinful action, right? And Sefer Hasidim explains why it is considered from their perspective, from its perspective, a sinful action. That's because the assumption is that these unworthy poor are going to be using, misusing, or even misabusing the money that they receive, the funding that they receive, by spending that charity, by spending the funds that they were given on nefarious actions, on the whores, on the gluttony. And therefore their acts, their evil ways, that they were again supported in in, in pursuing by the funding that by the tzedakah that they receive, those evil acts will in fact transfer back to the person who enabled them by giving them that money to begin with. All right, but that already, the idea that giving tzedakah to the wrong people can be sinful, that is something again that is distinctive to Sefer Hasidim. I wanna take a look at this next passage from Sefer Hasidim to take that one step further. Here, Sefer Hasidim, um, and, and again, you, you get a little bit of a sense that we've seen in previous weeks also that many of these passages in Sefer Hasidim are um, presented, are built as interpretations of scripture, right? So that they're grounding, the, Sefer, the authors of Sefer Hasidim very much grounded their ideas in Jewish tradition. Right, wherever they may have come from, wherever we might uh, think um, these ideas were impacted and influenced, um, they're certainly by the authors of Sefer Hasidim being presented as traditional, 
right, as grounded in scripture and in other traditional Jewish writings. So here too, um, the authors of Sefer Hasidim be, actually open their passage with a quotation from the Midrash Halacha on Sefer Vayikra, right? This is the, the unbolded words on the screen before you. The beginning of this passage from Sefer Hasidim is a direct quotation from Torah Kohanim or the Sifra, the Midrash Halacha on Sefer Vayikra, right? Which says, which teaches, from where do we learn that a person is duty bound to sustain the poor man even four or four times, meaning even if this is the fourth or the fifth time that the same poor person has fallen on the dole, right? That the same poor person is coming to ask for tzedakah, right? We know that tzedakah is supposed to enable a person, is supposed to help a person to get back on their feet. Here, the person is coming already four or five times. How do we know that it's nonetheless an obligation to assist that person? Well, says the Torah Kohanim, we can learn it from the verse in Leviticus in Sefer Vayikra, um, and you can see the verse itself at the bottom of your screen. The verse is, right? If your kinsman being in straight comes under your authority and you hold him as though a resident alien, let him live by your side. So it teaches the Torah Kohanim, right? The, the Pasuk says, help him. This is in other words, an unqualified imperative that applies in all cases, right? There's no, uh, there's no qualification, there's no boundary to helping this person. And so that means that you're supposed to help him as many times as he or she may come to ask for help. Says Torah Kohanim, one might think that this is so, right? and again, this is not yet Sefer Hasidim speaking, right? This is the Torah Kohanim, this is the Midrash. One might think that this is so, even if he, meaning the poor person, the one who's asking for tzedakah, is mafsido letarbut ra'a. And I purposefully did not translate that here. It's a very tricky phrase, right? You might think that you're obligated to help this person four, five, 10, 100 times, even if that person uses the funds, letarbut ra'a, right, the person Mafsido kind of suggests loses the funds or misuses the funds. Tarbut I think the simplest way of translating, translating that is for, uh, again, I would say nefarious or bad purposes, corrupt purposes, right? But says the verse, right? We're supposed to learn from the verse with the, right? That's the end of the verse, v'chai imach, or specifically imach. In other words, suggests the Midrash, you're supposed to help this person if they live as you do. That is to say, if they conduct themselves properly. Right, now up to here, right? We haven't yet gotten to Sefer Hasidim. This is the Midrash, right? That Sefer Hasidim is quoting, right? This Midrash is, I think, very much in line with the passage that we just saw from the Talmud Bavli. This idea that there are, again, more deserving poor, less deserving poor, that the poor who use the charity money that they receive for bad purposes, right, they are not to be supported, right? That idea repeats itself in the Midrash, much as we saw it did in the Bavli. That is not an idea that is unique to Hasidei Ashkenaz. Now, by the way, this Mafsidol Tarbutra, right, could possibly be translated as, right, he, as, as simply this person is a transgressor, right? Mafsidola Tarbutra'a, some suggest that it might be translated as if this person is a transgressor, because it kind of sounds like a very uh, oft used phrase in medieval rabbinic scholarship, yatsala tarbutra, a person who goes into or goes out into evil ways, which is essentially a transgressor. But Mafsidola Tarbutra'a, um, was actually translated by the contemporaries of Hasidei Ashkenaz, um, by other medieval scholars, as in fact someone who, again, Mafsidei, who loses it, who spends it, who uses, misuses it, this money, for, again, as I said, tabutra, meaning nefarious purposes. Now, where Sefer Hasidim comes in is in the following sentence, the one that I bolded here, right? So Sefer Hasidim, picking up on this Midrash, writes, even if he, meaning the poor man, is his father, his meaning 
the charity giver's father. Right? So even if the person who's coming to ask for charity is the man's own father, if he gives him charity, he aids sinners in achieving their ends. Furthermore, even if the father spends the charity money on food, right, so that the charity money that he's being given is not going directly to any nefarious purpose, that simply enables him to spend the money coming from other sources on bad ways. Now, where do you see the difference between what we read in the Midrash, the beginning of this passage, and the addition provided by the author of Sefer Hasidim itself? What is, what is distinctive about this, the, the bolded section of this passage, which is the, the addition of Sefer Hasidim, or the gloss, you could say, of Sefer Hasidim? Right? In other words, my question is, how does Sefer Hasidim translate the message of the Midrash? It sounds as if uh, he's interpreting that uh, Achicha and Chaimach is not just your actual relative or someone you're living with, but rather somebody who has your own values um, uh, in terms of uh, service of God and religious uh, observance, um, so that it could even be your father. Um, and nevertheless, uh, if if he's going to use it, uh, the money for nefarious purposes, it doesn't matter. You shouldn't give it. So the importance is less the people and your closeness, but rather how they're going to use and what they're going to do with the money. Yeah, I agree with you, although I think that that is already expressed in the Midrash itself. Again, the unbolded words are the Midrash, right? The, the regular writing there at the beginning of the passage is the Midrash. The Midrash itself seems to suggest, right, that, again, how do we know that you're not supposed to continually give charity to someone if that person is mafsido le tarbutra? Well, says the Midrash, we can learn that from the word in the pasuk, Imach, right? Imach, exactly as you just expressed, suggests that you are supposed to be providing for someone who is, a, is, a, is an, a member of the society that you wish to support, right? I guess is another way to say it, right? A person who conducts himself as you see fit, as you see proper. Now, so that idea is already in the Midrash, but Sefer Hasidim, I think, takes it further. Now, Sefer Hasidim, in talking about, you know, the father, right, Sefer Hasidim is picking up on, Sefer Hasidim in various places talks about, um, you know, again, there's, there's a general understanding in Jewish tradition that tzedakah um, works in kind of concentric circles, that one's first responsibility is to those closest to them, meaning their first order relatives. If your first order relatives need financial support, then your tzedakah money should be going first to your own relatives, right? Then it goes, you know, to the people who, you know, live in your immediate neighborhood. Then it goes to the people of your city, right? The poor of your city take precedence over the poor of other cities, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that the authors of Sefer Hasidim question again and again is whether that order of preference, which again, we see already in Talmudic, meaning very classic Jewish sources, whether that classic order of preference gets disrupted in any way by the standing, by the deservingness of those poor, right? So Again, this idea that we see of you know, worthy poor and unworthy poor, which does already come from classic Jewish sources, is very much, it keeps getting really harped on and repeated and focused on by the authors of Sefer Hasidim, insofar as they're trying to tease out how does that shake up or change in any way what we know is the kind of classic order of responsibility, those who are closest to you, and then those who are a bit further away, be it again on a familial level or be it on a you know literal geographic proximity level. 
but what what I think the author of Sefer Hasidim here um, does in terms of going a step further than the Midrash, beyond all that, is that he's the author of Sefer Hasidim here is suggesting that once a person, a poor person, has entered the category or made themselves into an unworthy poor, right? A person who is uh, known to engage in these, uh, you know, unsavory acts, then giving that person charity, even when the charity funds themselves are going to be used for the right purposes, right? Even, right, giving that person money to buy food and you know the person is gonna take, the, you can walk the person to the supermarket and help them buy the sandwich that's going to sustain them. That for the author of Sefer Hasidim is not okay. Right, so there's no way of redeeming the unworthy poor, right? There's no way of redeeming the act of charity, I should say, towards the unredeeming, towards the unworthy poor, because even providing those unworthy poor with a proper sustenance, with appropriate sustenance, is a problematic act. And I want to remind you again that for the authors of Sefer Hasidim, this is sin for the charity giver, because in helping that person or allowing that or enabling that person to use your charity funds for the right purposes, like getting food, you're only in effect enabling them to use all their other money for bad purposes, right? There's no way, in other words, to redeem them. There's no way to redeem, excuse me, the act of charity. There's no way that the act, an act of charity towards these categorically unworthy poor can ever be a positive or a good thing. And that I think is really, as I said, quite far reaching. Now, um, this idea um, of, again, worthy poor and non-worthy poor, um, again, as I said, really runs throughout Sefer Hasidim. I just wanna take a quick look at this one passage over here where Sefer Hasidim says, talks about a righteous man or a tzaddik who's in need of charity and a wicked man or a rasha um, who is in need of charity. Both of them are standing in front of you and you can only give to one of them. And the Rasha says that if you don't give him the money, he'll convert to Christianity or commit another offense, but not that of murder, right? He's going to do a bad thing, but not murder. Then what you're supposed to do is to give to the Tzaddik and let the Rasha go to hell. However, if he's about to commit murder, give him the money as ransom for the innocent man so that he will not be killed, right? So the only time that you're allowed to maybe somehow, um, you know, bend your principles and give tzedakah to a, and here again, the author doesn't mince words, says very clearly that this is a rasha, a, a really, um, a, a wicked poor person, only if it's really directly about saving another person's life, right? If that person's going to commit murder, if you don't give him the funds. Now, our time is just about up, but what I want to um, conclude with is that there has been a very significant debate among scholars of Sefer Hasidim concerning the meaning of these of this terminology, Sadiq and Rasha, um, or as we saw beforehand, the Mehuganim velo mehuganim, or the yare shamayim velo mehuganim, mehuganim, right? What is what does the author? What do the authors of Sefer Hasidim? Who are they really referring to when they talk about these different categories of poor people that they then place into this hierarchy? And some scholars of uh, you know contemporary scholars of Sefer Hasidim argue quite forcefully that for the authors of Sefer Hasidim, the difference between a tzaddik and a rasha, or the difference between a yare shamayim and a nam mehuganim, is actually the difference between a chassid, a pietist, and a non-chassid. Right? And they suggest that all of these passages concerning, or many of these passages concerning tzedakah hierarchies that, as we said, are very unique to Sefer Hasidim, are in fact another expression of the way in which the authors of Sefer Hasidim, as we've discussed previously, divide the world, divide their world into pietists and non-pietists, 
into those who are worthy and those who are non-worthy. And just to make this a little bit clearer, I want to take at this. I, I want to take a look quickly at this quote from Ivan Marcus, who, as we've uh, encountered before, is considered one of the foremost scholars of Sefer Hasidim of, of Hasidut Ashkenaz um, in uh, recent years, who writes very, uh, very explicitly. Um, and again, here I apologize. I just can't see my own screen, so I'm going to have difficulty with the first line here. Um, but that the author of Sefer Hasidim interpreted and applied in a. Excuse me. Um, you know what, can I just ask someone to please read that because I really can't read my own quote, I'm sorry. Just quickly, the first line over there. Uh, which line? The first line of the, of the uh, Ivan Marcus quote, excuse me, from right over here. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying, uh, let the non-pietist uh, go to hell, is that what you're talking about? No, the first line, the beginning. You know, you know, I'll just pick up over here, right? That, that, that basically that this was applied in a, um, despite the risk of creating tensions with non-pietist acquaintances and even family, you see I'm picking up in the third line over there, by indicating how a pietist should give, Sefer Hasidim reveals the author's exclusivistic scale of values. Moreover, giving money to a non-pietist is a sin, as we said. Not giving charity to a non-pietist is itself an act of pietism, right? And he's reading again the Rasha and the Tzaddik as the piet, as the, or the Tzaddik and the Rasha as the pietist and the non-pietist. So everything that we said beforehand about giving money to a non-worthy person as being sinful for the author of Sefer Hasidim, in Marcus's understanding, that means that for the authors of Sefer Hasidim, giving money to a non-pietist, a non-Hasid is in fact a sin. Not giving charity to a non-pietist is itself an act of pietism, right? Refraining from giving money to this rasha, um, which he reads um, for, for many reasons as a reference to the non-pietists is in itself an act of pietism. One should go to great lengths, even leaving a town to avoid, avoid supporting non-pietists, including one's own father. Unless a non-pietist threatened to murder someone, right? And this is a reference to the passage that we just saw, the very last passage if a pietist does not give him charity, right? So this here, he's clearly reading the rasha as the non-pietist, not as a evil or corrupt person, but as a non-pietist. A pietist must not yield to threats to commit a sin. Even if he should threaten to apostatize, the pietist is to resist helping a non-pietist. Let the non-pietist go to hell. And I want to remind you that the passage that we read said, in fact, right? Right, let the corrupt person, let the evil person go to Gehinom. But according to Marcus, that is in effect a reference to any non-pietist. Now, since our time is up, I'm going to pause here um, and we'll pick up with this um, at the beginning of our session next week. But I also, I already want to let you know that other scholars disagree with Marcus and one of the outspoken uh, of the naysayers um, is in fact Chaim Soloveitchik, who we have also, I have also quoted previously um, as an important voice um, reading Sefer Hasidim um, contemporarily. Um, and we'll, we'll continue with that next week. Um, so let's end here, but certainly if there are any questions, um, I would be more than happy to take an extra minute or two to answer them. Can I just say something? Uh, and First, to thank you. What it's just such a relevant and to this minute conversation and uh, the insights you've given us. Uh, do you mind if I suggest uh, a book that has now just won all kinds of awards for wonderful literature, but mm -hmm. is dealing literally with all of this, uh, not from a Jewish point of view, mm -hmm. but because the Jewish point of view embraces every angle anyway. It's called, maybe some of you have read it, and I uh, I so suggest it as, uh, as a work of art and specifically for this is, it's called Trust by Hernan. Okay. You, you um, Dr. First, you've got to take a look at this. It's, sure. it's exactly what you're talking about. Called Great, Trust by Hernan yeah. Diaz, D-I-A-Z. Okay. Everyone Great, should, you. it's just terrific. And um, so, excellent. to Thanks say nothing suggestion. of the fact that uh, colleges are dealing with this all the time in terms of being criticized 
uh, uh, philanthropists for giving to colleges that are already swimming in money and don't mm. need it rather than yeah, giving yeah, to yeah. those colleges so definitely- that really do need yeah. it, you know, yeah. to offer scholarships, et cetera. Great. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. And thank you for pointing out really the some of the contemporary um, significance of these of these uh, of these questions that the authors of Sefer Hasidim and other medieval Jews were dealing with as well. Okay. Um, any if there are no other questions, any other questions? Um, then let's again let's conclude for today, and um, we will pick up with this um, at the beginning of next session, and then uh, and then continue on. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you to all the participants that joined us today and in general uh, in all of our classes here at Jerisha. Um, Just just a note that this uh, upcoming Sunday, March 19th at noon Eastern, uh, we will have the annual Rappaport uh, Family Memorial Lecture, which will be dealing with questions um, regarding the Passover Seder. Um, So I hope to see you there. And as always, you can go on our website for more information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.